only barely begins to describe what's happening in Nigeria. In recent days, Boko Haram militants in trucks and armored vehicles went into 16 villages in the north of Nigeria, bringing grenade launchers, assault rifles, heavily armed, burning homes to the ground, spraying bullets indiscriminately. Some local officials say that the death toll, death toll could be 2,000 people, most of them women, children, elderly. And we're now finally getting the images that actually reveal, when you talk about 2,000 dead in 16 villages, it, it's, it's hard to understand, but we now have images of the devastating attack. Joining me now are Salil Shetty, the Secretary General of Amnesty International, and Dan Eyre, the organization's Nigeria researcher. Thank you both so much for being with us and for uh, giving the world a chance to understand what we're hearing about when we hear about Boko Haram. Secretary General, you are now providing the powerful images to the world. This is uh, two of the towns that were attacked earlier this month. On the left, a January 2nd image. Everything in red is life. So that's trees, that's homes, that's people, that's schools, that's livestock. It's life. On the right, the image taken January 7th. As you can see, life essentially eradicated in these two towns. Secretary General, do you know how many people were killed? Well, we, we are very sure from the visual evidence we have that the numbers which the Nigerian government is talking about, 150, is ridiculously low. But I mean, you can see that this is a place which have which has hundreds of thousands of people living there, and uh, that we have we have satellite images from two towns, Baga and uh, a second village not very far away, Dorobaga, and we, the second one is almost wiped out entirely from the from the map. So. Uh, there's no way in which you know the numbers can be small, but it's hard to say exactly what the numbers are. Yeah. Uh, but the eyewitness accounts have corroborated from the ground that we are talking about you know significant numbers of people who lost their lives. But also, I mean, you know, everything is lost. It's not just the life, but they have lost their livelihoods, the the clinics, the hospitals. I mean, the entire village has been wiped out almost. And and if it weren't for these images, you know, we would still be having, as you point out. Some of the villages saying it was thousands, the Nigerian government saying 150 people. Uh, the world doesn't know what to believe and they move on. But these images make it impossible for people to move on. Dan, I know you've been in close contact with people on the ground. You've had a chance to talk to them. Uh, what can you tell us about the situation right now there? That's right. So the people I've spoken to, eyewitnesses to the attack on Baga, have told me about the, the violence of the attack. They spoke about how Boko Haram went house to house, pulling out of people their people pulling out people out of their homes and shooting them in the streets. They've also told me that Boko Haram fighters were lying in wait for civilians. They were hiding in the trees surrounding the town and shot civilians as they tried to escape the violence. Now these are people that I've spoken to who have reached the safety of uh, the capital of Borno State, Maiduguri, and also who have crossed Lake Chad into the into neighbouring Chad. And they are still trying to find uh, their relatives and seek assistance from local government authorities. Secretary General, the world now hears about these atrocities. Here's things like Dan saying that Boko Haram militants are hiding in trees, uh, waiting to slaughter innocent civilians. This week, we heard about three little girls, one of them 10 years old, who was strapped by a militant with explosives, sent into a market, and then the militant actually detonated the girl. So scores of people died in this, and this girl was horrifically murdered. It's an evil that few can comprehend. The world so far has done very little, though. What can be done? What, what as Amnesty International, are you now asking the world to do? I think first and foremost, the Nigerian government has to take action. It has to protect civilians. It has to provide humanitarian assistance. That's equally true of the government in charge. So there's a very immediate issue of providing humanitarian support to those who are displaced, people in camps. Um, and the second thing, of course, is to protect civilians from new attacks. So this is really what the, and, and investigate these attacks. You know, one of the problems we've had is that the government's not investigating them properly and they're constantly trying to underplay the size and scale of the problem <coughs> they're dealing with. You're very right to also, you know, reflect a little bit on why is the international community, uh, the regional bodies, uh, really neglecting such a serious problem. I mean, what the satellite imagery is showing us is something which we've known for a long time, but it's giving us visual evidence right. of the scale and the devastating attacks involved. Very, very powerful images, and we appreciate the fact that you're bringing them to the world's attention. Thank you both very much for being with us. And out front now, Jeff Porter, the CEO of North Africa Risk Consulting and the former NATO Supreme Allied Commander, retired four-star general Wesley Clark. 
All right, good to have both of you with us. Um, let me just start with what we just heard. We saw that image, that incredibly powerful image, Jeff. We have just heard Dan saying he talked to people who were in those villages, that Boko Haram militants would be hiding in trees to try to slaughter people as they came by. They're sending 10-year-old girls into markets, strapped with explosives and, and, and detonating them. How is it possible that this sort of thing is happening, really with impunity? It's happening every day in Nigeria. Well, I, I think the fundamental reason is that there is no political will in Abuja to combat Boko Haram. In the capital um, of Nigeria. That's correct. Mm -hmm. um, President Goodluck Jonathan seems to think that this does not pose an existential threat to Nigeria, that this is a northern problem. He thinks that this doesn't jeopardize his re-election chances next month. Uh, he feels as if it's a, an issue that will eventually go away, and he isn't dedicating the resources to properly combat it. I mean, that, that's certainly the case. And, you know, General Clark, um, you know, we were just, the French ambassador of the UN was just here. He's talking about France's involvement uh, in, in this part of the world, which is very significant. The French president has talked about Boko Haram. He said, quote, Boko Haram is a major threat for all of Western Africa, now Central Africa, with proven links to Al Qaeda and other terrorist organizations. Boko leaders even said they want to strike the United States. At this point, that's an ambition, not a reality. But, but to the point of the fact that the world is looking the other way, how big are Boko Haram's ambitions? Well, they're, they're large because all of these groups are interconnected. Mm -hmm. And the more successful they are, the more support they draw from the band of, uh, of zealots and extremists who want to participate. So uh, as Boko Haram goes unchallenged or largely unchallenged in northern Nigeria, mm -hmm. the threat grows exponentially. It's not just a threat to Nigeria. It's a regional threat, and it will at some point mm -hmm. become more than that. Uh, Nigeria is another theater of operations. We're watching it. We're taking actions against it on the margin, on the margin. but not uh, large-scale actions because uh, the United States is going to have to deal with this situation for a long, long time as these mm -hmm. terrorist organizations morph along the world, around the world. We've got to get the government of Nigeria to accept its responsibilities right. for its own citizens. Now, how we do that is a matter of leadership. It's not just pressure got to provide assistance, but a lot of it is pressure. And, and, and to your point, they have not. They have not been fighting it. I mean, Jeff, the, here's the man who's believed to be the leader of Boko Haram, self, at least as far as, as we can tell at this time, speaking shortly after he abducted, which everyone watching this program will remember, abducted 276 schoolgirls. <laughs> When that happened, the world took notice. For, for a brief moment, they took notice. You had Michelle Obama. You know, we have the image when she was walking around carrying the sign, Bring Back Our Girls, which I'll show everyone. More than 200 of those girls are still missing. It's been almost a year. The world effectively wanted to do something, couldn't, and hasn't done anything at all. So what, what needs to happen now? Or do we just accept those girls are gone? Well, um, it's also important to underscore that since that initial round of kidnapping, there have been subsequent kidnappings. There right. have been more kidnappings of girls and of boys yes. and of adults. So the, the, the problem, that was the initial foray, and there have been subsequent forays since then. What needs to happen is there has to be a, a, a real serious reform of the Nigerian military. Uh, at the moment, it's impossible for U.S. troops to work with Nigerian military troops because of the Leahy Law. The Leahy Law stipulates that the U.S. cannot train foreign troops that have been involved in human rights abuses. And that amounts to just about every Nigerian military unit in the country. So what needs to take place is new units need to be created consisting of individuals that have not been involved in human rights abuses. And then the U.S. may be able to begin to work to train those, those soldiers to properly combat Boko Haram. There also has to be a shift in the political environment. And if Good Luck Jonathan loses the presidential elections and General Bukhari wins the presidential elections, which is a possibility, mm. then you could have a restoration of morale within the Nigerian military mm. and a real possibility of deploying Nigerian military troops to the north to combat Boko Haram and, and, and curtail the kidnapping trend. A final word, General Clark. You've got tremendous corruption in Nigeria fed by oil. There's tremendous flows of money going through Nigeria. It affects all the governance. And what we're really talking about is not only the reform of the military, but also real governance in the North. People want government to serve them. 
They want protection. Mm -hmm. They want transportation. They want access to health facilities. They want education. And none of those services are being provided in the north of Nigeria. Now, the first step, of course, is security. Mm -hmm. But until you have a government in Abuja that's pushing and in a non-corrupt fashion that doesn't require payoffs mm -hmm. and that's not focused on the richer sections but accepts its responsibility mm -hmm. for leadership and for taking care of the people of Nigeria, all the other measures, even if we had the best soldiers in the world in there, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's not going to work. This is a governance problem. Thanks so much to both of you. And next, the world is angry about government spying. But we've learned...